Hello, good evening, um, and welcome to DIA Artists and Artists Lecture Series. I'm Jasmine Raymond, and this is the second lecture in this season, and I would like to remind you of our upcoming programs um, this fall. On November 8th, Kim Gordon will speak on the work of Dan Graham, and on December 13th, Joachim Koster will reflect on Solowit. I also would like to take this opportunity to mention, um, now that I'm on the microphone, <laughs> to send an invitation to a new program that we're hosting in this uh, same space on Thursday nights, once a month. It's our beloved program that Dia had called Readings in Contemporary Poetry. We kicked the program last Thursday with John Giorno and Taylor Meads, and that was really fantastic. And our upcoming uh, match with Eileen Miles and Stacy Semansek on December third. Um, sorry, on November ninth. Oh God, I got it all wrong. No, I, November fourteenth, and on December thirteenth we have Charles Bernstein and Tim Peterson. Check on the website because. Obviously, I'm not very good with dates. <laughs> but I'd like to begin by thanking um, C Foundation and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their generous support of this program. And I also like to thank Jean Dreskin and Patrick Hellman, who help us every Monday um, put this series together. Um, the 2010 and 11 series is dedicated to the memory of Bradford Race, the Trustee from 2002 to 2010. Now, I'm very happy tonight to introduce um, Peter Haley. And the impetus of tonight's lecture arise this summer after I read Peter's provocative text on Franz Erhard Walter's work. I was doing the research for the exhibition that is currently at Dia Beacon called Works as Action. And I encountered Peter's writing, uh, a text titled, Work Needs the Body, a Strong Misreading, that he did in 2003. And after that, I thought this was a match, a perfect match, and that I needed um, to extend an invitation to consider, um, to see if he will consider speaking on Franz Erhard Walter's work. Um, since many of you probably are not familiar with Franz's work, um, he's had very um, small visibility in the United States, and actually this is the first exhibition in this country since 1990, first major museum exhibition. Peter Halley was born um, in New York, in 1953, he graduated, as many of you probably know, from Yale University with a BA in 1975, and obtained his MFA from the University of New Orleans in 1978. That same year, he had his first solo exhibition um, at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. And five years later, at the age of 30, he was already able to afford part-time assistants to help him with his treasures and um, prepare his work um, with him to allow himself the time to paint, which is what he really wanted to do. As he put it, he needed to protect that moment of actual painting to happen. And painting is what he's done. For the last 32 years, he's mounted over 120 solo exhibitions. <laughs> And I counted that. So um, they, they include museums such as um, the Museum de Art Contemporary in Bordeaux, the Museo Nacional del Centro de Arte de Reina Sofia, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, the Des Moines Art Center, the Dallas Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Kit Kitak Chushu Municipal Museum of Art in Japan, the Museum of Folk One in Essen, and the Butler Institute of American Art in 1999. Halley set out to resist the transcendental claims often associated with geometric abstraction, and he ventured to develop a very playful definition of, of non-representational art based on a seamless inclusion of theoretical underpinnings such as philosophy and psychology with sources ranging from flow charts to medieval behavior, uh, model behavior, commercial advertising, popular printing, video games, all the way into computer-generated images. His new system of abstraction, one could say, in an in 
um, led him into a signature style that um, over 32 years has been defined and he has defined it as such as prisons and cells that recall the system and the ideologies in which we live in in post-industrial society. Since the mid 90s, Halley has produced site-specific installations for exhibitions as well as for, for permanent spaces in the United States and abroad. And he has written numerous texts on contemporary art culture throughout these years. His early essays, which address post-structuralism, post-modernism, and digital revolution of the 1980s has been anthologized in two books of his complete writings. And as many of you know and have been influenced and um, very much nurtured by his tremendous work from 1996 to 2006 as the publisher in the in of Index Magazine. These are texts that we all benefited in school, and I'm very flattered that we are here tonight um, with you. Thank you for all that, for both your art and your writing. It's been really important for many of us and many of our generations. Since 2002, Halley has been the director of graduate studies in painting and printmaking at Yale University School of Art. In 2001, he received the Frank Jevet Mather Award from the College of Art Association for his critical writing. Just about two, two or three weeks ago, he opened a solo exhibition in Moscow. So he's probably catching his breath, but please help me welcome Peter Halley. Uh, thank you, Yasmil, for that wonderful introduction. I, I, I think I should mention in, in about the uh, stretchers that I, the truth is I couldn't really make a straight stretcher, so I had to find somebody to help me. Uh, I'd also like to thank you and uh, Jean Dreskin of the curatorial uh, um, uh, team here uh, for all your help in preparing this talk. It was really quite extraordinary. Uh, all this information on Franz Erhard Walter, which isn't so easy to find, and it, it was uh, 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 really unique in terms of the help I got from you all uh, in my experience. Um, now, I'm, this is just a little bright. Is there any adjustment possible to the light? Oh, thank you so much. Well, my talk tonight is going to be in uh, three parts. <laughs> Uh, th that's, okay? that's great. Could we have the audience lights up just a little bit? The audience? Uh, if, if we could uh, just put them on dim, that would... Uh, do they dim, or...? Is that too much? Can uh, we see the screen? Is that good? Okay, yeah. thanks. I'd like that much better. Appreciate it. Um, I, tonight's talk is going to be in three parts, and uh, Yasmil, regrettably, the first part, I, I'm, I'm going to... Um, uh, deliver the, the uh, catalog essay that I, I wrote, I believe, in 1998, according to my records, but it, it may have been published later. I'm not sure. But uh, I, I, uh, what I wrote in that essay, I, I still sort of stand behind, and I couldn't really think of any better way to say it. Um, following that, I'd like to talk about Franz Erhard Walter's work and some affinities with artists working with the body and with uh, performance at the time. Because certainly the uh, 60s uh, going into the early 70s was an amazing period in, in performance. And it's fascinating to see how Walter's work uh, overlapped with other artists working at the time. And, uh, and as the final part, I'll, I'm going to talk about uh, my experience uh, seeing uh, Franz Erhard Walter's work for the first time at uh, DIA last Saturday. And my, the interesting thing about my experience with his work, I probably saw his work first when I was 20 years old, and almost my entire knowledge of his career was based on photography and the photographs of his work. And of course, with uh, uh, site-specific or temporarily limited work uh, going back to the 60s and 70s, that's the way uh, many of us have experienced these pieces. And a kind of subtext of what I'll talk about tonight is really that to me, my experience of his work, uh, or um, I, I, I'm almost 
come to the feeling that the photography of the work from the 60s uh, and the work are two distinct bodies of work that, that have a different kind of meaning and can be read or, uh, or almost need to be read uh, quite differently. Whenever one artist writes about another's work, the artist writer necessarily brings to the work the baggage of his or her own ideological preferences and sees the work through the lens of his or her own practice. With this realization, I'm undertaking to read, but also to misread the work of Franz Erhard Walter, an artist who has fascinated me since I first encountered his work as a 20-year-old student. Uh, during this part of the talk, I'm um, showing uh, images of his work from the 60s to early 70s, uh, the series of work that's on, uh, on exhibition at Dia called Werk uh, Satz, or Work Sentences. The earliest pieces are 63, the latest I think about 70 or 71. And um, along the way here, I've also thrown in some later pieces. In this instance, the inevitability that I will misread the work is compounded by cultural distance as well. I've never seen a Franz Erhard Walter performance in person till Saturday. Like the works of other body-oriented performance artists of the 60s and 70s, I know his work only through the filtered evidence of documentary photographs. Further, I'm a virtual stranger to both the debates within the German art scene and within the performance conceptualist movement of 30 years ago. Therefore, I cannot claim to be able to read the work either as a first-hand experience or with a first-hand knowledge of the context from which it emerged. And yet, my misreading will not necessarily do a disservice to the work. Duchamp originally argued that a work must be interpreted by the viewer in order to be completed. Roland Barthes also stated that what separates modernist works from those of the past was that the modernist work constituted an open polyphonous text that could and would yield a multiplicity of interpretations. To my own misreading, yet another model applies, that of Harold Bloom, who first coined the term a strong misreading. For Bloom, every artist who draws lessons from the art of the previous generation must necessarily misinterpret it. It is a creativity of this misinterpretation that lends continuing relevance to works of art. Thus, Picasso misreads Cezanne, and Stella misreads Pollock. Bloom implies that a vital mechanism is at work here. The artist who creates significant work, like Walter, embeds within the work not only his own intentionality, but other cogent signifiers that succeeding generations will inevitably interpret in the artist's stead. Of all the artists working with the body in the years around 1970, Walter was the only one uh, to whose work I have felt attached. Each of the important artists of that period involved himself or herself with significant issues. Vio Acconci removed the sexualized male gaze from the female body and refocused it on his own. Chris Burden turned himself into a kind of artistic test pilot, martyring his own body to the indignities of contemporary culture. Bruce Nauman transformed himself into a tragic comic Beckett-inspired clown. But Walter was the only artist to bring bodies into contact with the principle of geometric order, who is the only artist to treat the body as anonymous and not as protagonistic. For what reason is this important? Michel Foucault, writing in the period just after Walter began making his most revolutionary body of work, in the, early, uh, in, the, in the late 60s, described the epoch of modernity as characterized by a dramatic increase in the regulation of bodies in space. He described modern space as a space in which bodies and their movements are constantly subject to the ordering of geometry, used as a method of rationalizing movement for the purpose of commerce and social control, a phenomenon we see in the layout of cities, in techniques of warfare, in the organization of schools, hospitals, and factories. For Foucault, the modern condition is that of the human being robbed of the autonomy of chaos and located like an impersonal cog in a labyrinth of mechanistic geometric space. 
The core of my own misreading of Walter is to see his work as a powerful and evocative enactment of this aspect of the space of modernity. The power of Walter's work comes from the fact that he does not simply picture or describe bodies in this regulated geometric space. Rather, he asks himself and others to themselves experience this space, like pilgrims retracing the Stations of the Cross. In uh, Kopfleib uh, Glieber, 1967, the participants build an open rectangular geometric box, just big enough to fit a human form out of soft cloth. Only so long as the participants hold the malleable material in position by the tension and rigidity of their own hands and bodies will the cloth retain its configuration as an abstract compartment. Um, similarly, in uh, Fear Cooper Hewitt, I'm sorry, I've never read this aloud. Uh, uh, 1968, the tension of four standing bodies harnessed around the waist transforms the limp cloth into the iconography of a rigid square as the bodies themselves hold the corners of the geometric form. In works like Soko Fir Bereisha and Ten Times Ort Strecke Ort, 1969, anonymous bodies are even further immobilized with their feet bound up by the sculptural restraints, eliminating their ability to move. As powerful as this work and strategy is, it is equally evocative. It is evocative because it removes all extraneous reference from its enactment of this experience of geometricized space. Nowhere is specificity, I'm sorry, nowhere is specific everyday circumstance allowed to enter. The sculpture and the geometry is made of only two materials, the warm living body and the soft limp cloth. Further, the performances took place in the abstract, flat space of the open air landscape. The characteristics of the world we inhabit are deline delineated using only these simple, timeless elements. There are no references to office cubicles, crowded autobuses, or solitary apartment houses. Only the psychology and physicality of this reality remains in distilled purity. Walter's initial formulation of this space uh, beginning the year 1963, is all the more surprising uh, since the 60s were a high point of countercultural activity. At the same time that many of his colleagues in all the arts were concerned with themes of the breakdown of order and exuberant cultural rebellion, Walter's own work reached a point of extreme asceticism and concern for order, whether that order is seen as classical or descriptive of the restraints of contemporary culture. However, this example of maverick thematics is not so strange if we consider that the youthful Walter was, in fact, an incredible prodigy, constantly producing works that seem to have anticipated other artists' ideas by five years or more. Walter's remarkable word paintings of 1958 uh, presaged later developments in both pop art and California-style conceptualism. Then, by 1963, Walter had become intensely involved with making objects that centrally recorded the pressure of hand and body on his materials. It is these works that he anticipates both sous les pavés, la plage, liberation spirit of 1968, with its emphasis on freeing the body from the constraints of repressive capitalist culture. The works that I just uh, described are previous to this body of work. Walter's insistence on order in his work of the 60s is an extraordinary intellectual premonition as well. It exactly anticipates the desire to delineate the constraints of contemporary culture that it would emerge in the work of other artists and intellectuals like Foucault himself during the 70s as they were forced by the failure of the 68 movement into an intense re-examination re of the structures of the culture that had withstood their revolutionary onslaught. Walter was again ahead of his time. On a formal level, the works are very much part of the astounding revolution in defining what a work of art could be that took place during that period. But during the 68 period, Walter's concern was not to create an anarchic, spontaneous manifestation. His pieces of this period have an almost mournful sense of anticipation. They seem to say, regardless of the alternately violent and exuberant atmosphere in which they were made, that this is a modern condition. We are anonymous. We are tied together by a system over which we have no control. 
we are assigned to places and told to play a role. There is more than a touch of absurdist humor in Walter's work of these years. Think of the piece in which two men stretch a, a piece of cloth girding their heads for three meters over the ground. Uh, as Walter's work of the late 60s asserts, this appraisal of modernity as an unstoppable, irreversible force sweeping all other cultural forms in its wake is an issue with which we have had to continue to wrestle from 68 until today. The same may be said of Walter's subsequent work. The works of the 68 period laid out a perspective that Walter would continue to follow. It should be noted that uh, from his first work in 1958, uh, with all his conceptual br brilliance, Walter was still a young artist whose work moved fluidly from idea to idea. He engaged an extraordinary panoply of issues, the syntactical impact of words, the heritage of neoplasticism, and to how to move it beyond the painted canvas, where the physical nature of painting could be, and how painting could be merged into sculpture. And the new phenomenology opened up as the artist's body became a syntactical element in contemporary art. The intelligence and energy of this explosion is comparable to that of a youthful Picasso, or the outpouring ideas in the work of the young Ellsworth Kelly a decade earlier in Paris. But after the 60s, when, uh, when he was not yet 30, Walter's ideas, oh, uh, I'm sorry. But after 1968, when Walter was not yet 30, his ideas would continue to unfold with a dance-like sense of elaboration and rhythm. Like the other body performance artists of the 60s period, Walter also moved back into the realm of, institu of the institution during the last three decades. This shift is thought-provoking. It perhaps demonstrates how dependent every artist is on the constantly changing cultural parameters determined by the society in which the artist functions, no matter how cogent the artist's vision is. And yet the artist's work need not be diminished by the limitations of living in less revolutionary times. Volta's work is a perfect case in point. His return to gallery and museum housed objects resulted in a period of intense elaboration in his work. His spaces became more complex and psychologically subtle. He began to enhance his work with concentrated attention to his basic means, the control of scale, the use of color, and his receptivity to the nature of his materials. But Walter's work of the last decades is further distinguished by the way he constantly moved to fashion a new genre of static sculpture. Almost all his pieces of this period read not only as sculpture, but as artifacts. <laughs> They seem like objects from an anthropology museum, objects taken out of the arena of their active use and preserved for inspection in a foreign environment. And it is here with the complexity of these objects that my own strong misreading of Walter begins to break down, eroded by the myriad overtones that his mature work yields. So many other misreadings of Walter are also possible. The intense focus of his work opens up a host of readings. One can speak of the theme of nomadism in his work. Everything Walter uses is portable and transportable. It is sculpture that can be folded up and carried from place to place, that is conceived as something to be set up and moved at will. A number of pieces incorporate clothing. In some, there are enclosures for the body that resemble sleeping bags or tents, suggesting the thematics of nomadic protection for the body. This nomadism touches on an important theme repeated in art and architecture from the 60s to the present, a vision of the human being no longer tied to one place, but roaming the globe as a kind of post-capitalist, electronic era world citizen. One could also speak of the archaic quality of Walter's work. The artist completely eschews modern materials for the atemporal medium of sewn cloth. He dyes his canvas cloth with colors that also appear timeless, yet somehow reminiscent of tribal or village culture. His hoods and cloaks likewise seem to come out of some ancient druidic past. But most importantly, his actions and objects in their stark symbolism mysteriously refer, refer back to what we might imagine as an ancient animist ceremony. They place their participants in the primal ceremonial configurations that the structuralists would claim to be the common language 
of all human religion. Lastly, one could even see Walter's language as a reclamation of the poetry of neoplasticism, as a project to reunite the pure geometry of the utopian 20s with the lived experience of the body. Like Le Corbusier, Walter rewrites the rules of geometric classicism to conform to the measure of the human body. His oeuvre can be seen as an effort to place the idealism of geometric form in relation to our actual physical bodily experience to depictorialize neoplastic abstraction. In this way, he seeks to bridge the philosophical chasm that divides idealist and materialist thought and art. But none of these multiple misreadings, all rich in and of themselves, would be possible without the phenomenological rigor of the artist's own agenda. Walter's pronouncements insist on the primacy of his own direct experience of making the work. Ironically, it is because of his own dedication to work and the body that the experiential intensity and the experiential intensity that his dedication yields that so much poetry and so many different poetics flow from his work. Um, having written that some years ago, um, preparing for this evening, I found that I wanted to look more closely at uh, Walter and his uh, contemporaries. Um, Walter was, uh, or, was or is, in what I uh, read, uh, skeptical about uh, Fluxus. Uh, but in looking at his work, I found a sort of strange affinity uh, with the uh, sort of existential stance of uh, Giacometti. Many of these uh, early Verksatz pieces uh, show isolated bodies moving on these flat planes. Uh, during this talk, you've been looking at these pictures, which, as photographs, constitute quite an extraordinary body of work. Um, actually, in the material that I've read, I don't know who took them or, or how they were organized. Uh, but again, with his work, as well as people like Robert Smith and Vito Conchi, Chris Burton, and others, it is quite remarkable to what an extent this photographic record uh, uh, forms an autonomous body of work. Um, one of the uh, first affinities I'd like to examine is between Walter's work and, um, and that of Ivan Rayner. Uh, this piece in dance is called Carriage Discreteness from 1966. Uh, 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 Rayner's work as well as that of uh, Tricia Brown and other members of the Judson Dance Group uh, engaged in simple actions, simple everyday things like moving, lifting objects, moving objects around, uh, as a um, reduced or minimal list uh, approach to dance. Uh, let me uh, compare this piece uh, to Walter's piece where the uh, task of the participants is to uh, form uh, this rectangular three-dimensional shape. Um, the other day, experiencing these pieces for the first time, what seemed particularly extraordinary to me is that um, um, uh, Yvonne Rayner, and here we have Tricia Brown. I don't have the date of this piece, but it, it's a couple of years before, after 1970, uh, are engaged in this exploration uh, using professional dancers. And one of the unique aspects of these Verksatz pieces is that when you engage them, you yourself are put in the position or um, role of a dancer without any kind of training. Every, anybody can do it. Uh, but the uh, feeling of do, working with the pieces as well as um, what it looks like when you see others do it is quite extraordinary. Uh, and I wanted to 
uh, compare that Trisha Brown piece of sort of tug of war uh, with this piece of uh, Walters from uh, 1960, uh, 1967, where the two participants uh, have their arm tied in that to that piece of cloth. Um, Walter came to New York and lived here for a few years around 1970. He had a small exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, he came to the United States because he felt uh, isolated working in Germany and didn't feel that he uh, was getting much response to his work from an audience or from his colleagues. Um, I'm sure he came here because of what was going on here, like the uh, Judson Dance Workshop. However, I'm not sure whether he had any experience of their work, and it's probably more improbable that they had any experience of his. What we see during these years is also an extraordinary uh, phenomenon of different people having similar ideas uh, at the same time. Um, I was listening to NPR this morning, and uh, uh, Stephen Johnson, who's a very interesting writer, just has written a book about this. Um, you know, people discover calculus or oxygen at the same moment independently. And uh, this era of uh, body and performance seems to be very similar. Uh, here's Trisha Brown again. Um, and here's Fra Franz Erhard Walter. Uh, again, in the realm of uh, performance, it's quite extraordinary that he, he came up with this language in which uh, uh, people untrained in any kind of discipline of the body or uh, techniques can engage in these uh, very poetic dance-like pieces. Um, I thought I would uh, include a piece by uh, uh, Fido Acanci, uh, again, to put the era in, uh, in perspective. Uh, this is 1970. This is one of these uh, pieces in which um, he followed people down the street. But again, it's another example of it's kind of a great photograph, and another example of the photographs uh, assuming a certain autonomy uh, from the original performance. Uh, I, I kind of would also like to um, stop here, pause here, just to talk about the idea of relational aesthetics. Um, to quote uh, Nicholas Borio, who claims that the role of artworks is no longer to form imaginary and utopian realities, but to actually be ways of living and models of action within the existing real, whatever scale chosen by the artist. And um, uh, I've often heard people like Franz Herod Walter or, or uh, Vito Conci referred to as precursors of relational aesthetics. But honestly, to me, that makes no sense if whatever, what is described as relational aesthetics is a Conchi, it is Walter, and some of the other artists as of the period. And um, I, I think the artists of the 90s would have to be described as a second generation manifestation of that tendency. Um, I'm sort of uh, stopped and paused at the, uh, to examine a relationship between Franz Herhard Walter and uh, Robert Morris, um, who, uh, during the mid-60s and 70s uh, seemed to touch on many of the same themes and same techniques as Franz, uh, Franz Herhard Walter uh, used. It seems even less likely that uh, they were in contact. But on the other hand, uh, Walter uh, uh, Morris, that is, uh, was sort of famous for borrowing from other artists at that point, so who knows. Uh, but in contrast to Franz Herhard Walter, this is a piece that uh, Robert Morris uh, did for the opening of the Tate Gallery in London in, uh, in uh, 1971, um, involving a bunch of platforms and objects uh, in a vast space. Uh, the Tate Gallery redid the show, um, I believe, in 2004. So this is a more recent photograph. Uh, the interesting part of the story is uh, the 1971 version was closed down because uh, so many people were injured, and then they cleaned it up in 2004, and um, um, uh, there were still like 20 injuries. <laughs> so in that sense, it's rather un-Francois Walter, 
But uh, the interesting thing is there was quite, I, on the internet I could find quite a bit of press about these injuries. And it is also a kind of um, uh, uh, reflection of how the uh, injuries are more pressworthy than the art. And here's one of Robert Morris's uh, felt pieces from uh, 1967. A uh, 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 curious parallel about his use of uh, felt. Uh, uh, Joseph Boys also used a lot of felt, of course, but somehow the Robert Morris pieces and the um, Walter pieces seem to have more of an affinity. I just wanted to trace a direction that uh, uh, Morris's examination of geometry took. Uh, he's a, an artist who, uh, whom I've always been interested in. And later in the 70s, he began to make uh, mazes of this kind, which obviously uh, have all kinds of meanings. But one of them is uh, the uh, direct um, uh, or emphatic uh, direction of how a, the human being using it can move. And uh, at the end of the 70s, he made a series of uh, drawings and prints called In the Realm of the Carceral. Uh, this one is called Stockade from 1978. And by that time, it seems that uh, Morris was beginning to look at the work of Michel Foucault and uh, his book on the uh, uh, history of the prison, which was translated into English in 78. I thought it was worth uh, touching on uh, Hermann Nietzsche uh, and his performances. I tried to find one that wasn't too gross. Uh, this is uh, 1968. You can tell what my sensibility is. Uh, but uh, these performances are, uh, are, are clearly based on a uh, reinvestment in a kind of Christian and pagan and uh, agricultural uh, uh, symbolism. Uh, the uh, performances involve uh, crucifixion, sacrifice of animals, blood as a holy um, uh, or spiritual element uh, enacted by, again, not dancers, but uh, I guess uh, people who choose to participate. And there's also this recurring uh, sort of use of what appears to me as some kind of ancient Christian symbolism in, um, in um, uh, Walter's work, uh, these crosses that he deploys uh, throughout the, uh, in this uh, open landscape. Uh, Yasmil, in our discussions uh, preparing for tonight, also uh, pointed out to me that he's from the town of uh, Ful Fulda, uh, which uh, also uh, uh, houses one of the earliest Christian churches in Germany. And uh, I kind of got on the theme of uh, crucifixion and early performance art. Here is uh, Chris Burden on the Volkswagen and uh, another similar sort of uh, uh, sacrificial piece, uh, Chris Burden, 1971. And here's uh, Walter again. Uh, finally, I thought it was uh, worth talking a little bit about uh, Walter and uh, Bruce Nauman. This is 1963, Walter. This is uh, a Nauman video, 1968, called Bounce, which he bounces up and down and the image is sideways. Franz, Franz Erhard Walter, 67. Nauman um, from 67. Uh, and this one is called uh, Square Dance. And then an outdoor piece by Walter also uh, playing on the idea of the modernist square, or perhaps even the mystical square. Um, it's really interesting to think about the uh, the nuance or direction each of these artists brings to uh, uh, pretty much shared concerns, and um, uh, yet at the same uh, at the same time, uh, how different uh, the uh, path of of, uh, of each of the artists would turn out to be. 
Um, Now, I had a kind of uh, revelatory experience on Saturday because uh, I've known these black and white photographs for so long, uh, really since I was uh, 20 years old. Uh, I had seen quite a few of them, and the, the quality of the photography itself, the, the black and white, the kind of uh, powerful contrast, uh, certainly uh, affected and perhaps even dictated the kind of misreading I, uh, I um, my misreading of Walter's work, which I recounted to you in that, that essay I wrote. Uh, seeing it, its uh, existential quality, its uh, quality of anonymity, and um, the sub subjugation of a human being to an impersonal order really all came out of these photographs. Now, at uh, DIA on Saturday, unfortunately, there's a, I can't show you any photographic evidence because, well, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but photography is not allowed. And uh, so I'm going to have to recount it uh, just through words. But in, in a way, in contrast to the photographic doc uh, documentation, perhaps it's kind of great that no, no photography took place. Um, but the, uh, the piece, the, these individual pieces from this, uh, Verksatz series, almost 60 pieces, um, are, um, uh, can all be wrapped up in canvas bags that all fit into one canvas bag. Uh, so a, a set of them was at DIA. They were unpacked, placed around the perimeter of a very large room, almost the size of a dance studio or a small gym. And uh, in the middle of the floor, there was a huge gray industrial carpet uh, and uh, what visitors were allowed to do was uh, choose a piece that they were interested in, not all of them were available, some were, and uh, um, give it a try. Um, uh, I, I, I was there the other day with uh, the artist Anne Craven, and Anne and I uh, did these two-person uh, pieces together, uh, the one where you tie the cloth around your waist and the two people lean against each other, and the other one where the cloth is above your head like a hood, and uh, when you stretch it out, uh, you actually see the other person's face if you stretch it hard enough. Um, and also a piece for an individual in which um, uh, there's this huge jacket about five inches thick that you put on and your arms sort of uh, stick out. And uh, we got to uh, try out these pieces, uh, but uh, we also saw other people doing it. You, only one group was allowed to go at a time. So after you were through, you saw other people uh, perform. And watching other people do it, it was quite extraordinary because there was a kind of awkwardness, how to adjust these things. But all the movements sort of resolved themselves into this very expressive, interesting dance-like movement. Now, the other thing, which was, even though I had seen Walter's later work, was the way these pieces were made. I didn't know what to expect. I thought they were just pieces of canvas. But they're all, you know, hand-dyed, Lord knows how. And a big um, uh, band like this, w w they were all stitched, like every couple inches, like striping, but these, the stitching seemed to be functional. And they had the most exquisite quality of some kind of, uh, traditional Japanese clothing or something like that. Uh, um, my little joke is it was very Muji, <laughs> if you remember that. <laughs> Another thing that was very, very interesting is um, all, these, <laughs> all these pieces are um, uh, uh, presented in a folded state. And after, first you unfold it. And then after you're through with your performance or interaction with the piece, uh, you fold it up again. And uh, there are um, creases in the cloth uh, that um, uh, uh, show you how it went. You know, it, it's folded the same way each time. And this, uh, this folding, this patient folding of the piece to get it back into its original uh, origami kind of shape was also very interesting, required a great deal of uh, patience and care, and it also served to slow down the time of the whole thing. You just didn't toss it back into a corner. But you unfolded slowly, which sort of slowed everything down, then you, you, you did your action with the piece, and then you folded it up again in a very uh, 
slow, painstaking manner. Um, so I, I, I think what I want to conclude with is an extraordinary feeling that I had that these same pieces constitute two bodies of work with almost um, antithetical readings. I don't think I could have written the piece I read to you if I had seen the Verksatz pieces or, or interacted with them uh, 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 before. I also want to uh, compliment everybody at DIA for allowing um, participants to actually use these things, which is, I think, almost unheard of for with artworks that are uh, about 60 years old, 50, 60 years old. Uh, but uh, but I, I think it allowed them to really come alive again. And so I, I, I want to end with that question. I mean, to what degree do the, these series of photographs, and I believe there's one official photograph for each piece, uh, reflect Walter's intentions? And to what, ex to what extent is my reading or misreading of the photographic evidence uh, a kind of misreading of the photographic norms of the time, or to what extent uh, did Walter perhaps um, uh, skew the, the body of work as photographs in a kind of existential direction? Um, and to con contrast that starkness uh, with the uh, truly uh, sensual and truly phenomenological experience uh, that one could have with the pieces, which is what Walter in his own uh, writing and discussion of the piece always emphasizes. Thank you. Should I answer questions or? Anybody have any questions? Regrettably, I can't, but I, uh, it, it seems to make a lot of sense and probably does reflect Walter's thinking pretty accurately. Um, his notes and um, uh, what he says about the work is, is quite dense and quite purist in its approach. And um, I might turn it over to uh, Yasmeel or anybody else who has any insight into this, but I have a hunch you're reflecting what, how he himself thinks about his pieces. Does that make sense? We'll, we'll, we'll let it at that. Great. Anybody else? Well, I urge you to see the show in Beacon. It's, oh. um, well, he, he, he continues to work with words. Um, I, I wasn't able to find the images of the early uh, word pieces, but he continues to make pieces with words up to the present time. The work I'm talking about is the German translation of uh, Werksatz is work sentences. And another theme you could find in his work is this uh, very interesting conflation of language and body, uh, or even language and materiality. And that also goes back to Carl Andre's uh, kind of wonderful early piece, A Stack of Language, where he stacks up words. It's a drawing, but as if it's a big pile of language. And uh, recently, I did see in Geneva a, uh, a big show at MAMCO there of, uh, of Walter, in which uh, the sort of center of the show was an alphabet. And he had made each letter as a three-dimensional piece. Um, uh, uh, and the A's, B's, C's, fewer on the wall, most were on the floor, are uh, 
scattered throughout the exhibition. And what was his objections to fluxes? I don't, he didn't say he had any objection. It was simply not an affinity he felt. Okay. But he did see them when, when they came to Cologne, mm -hmm. uh, to do certain work, when they were there, he did see them there, and he even participated in a soiree, but, but, but he was too young to really, he was a bit younger, 10 years younger than them. Mm -hmm. So he didn't feel that that was, he was more interested in, I would say, and now I'm blanking on the visiting system. But, I, but he had other influences that were not the obvious ones to us. But even like when he came to New York, he, his affinity was to, to be with Walter de Maria, right? And um, his friends were, he met Klaus Oldenburg, but he really was with Robert Ryman and with Walter de Maria. And so it's not something that looks very similar to his work, but it was, this was the group of people that he was with. I'm not sure uh, how to find a, uh, the, uh, w w which is a full uh, catalog of his work, but uh, it's really quite extraordinary what he was doing from like the age of 20 on almost in isolation, and doing pieces in which there's an extraordinary range of themes, like uh, 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 touch, language, transfer, and especially this uh, rapid fire transformation of traditional painting into something else, which a lot of people were uh, up to at that point. But uh, he do does it with an extraordinary intensity and without too many connections, at least before he comes to New York. Um, and it's, I, I've met him a couple times, I, I don't know him, but you, you feel that his uh, development of these ideas was very much <laughs> within the body, within the practice of work, and not, not, not triggered by an intellectual framework. And as such, this, uh, his involvement with his work, which he maintains throughout all his writings is the essence of the whole thing, seems like an, an extraordinary creative, an example of extraordinary creative intensity. That's a good question. Uh, I've always wondered, like, because the pieces are almost like they need people, bodies, and space. And what if you're on your own? Maybe you have a complete Well, I believe there's always, uh, with, with Walter himself, an idea there is somebody to show you. I'm not sure if he ever used photographs to demonstrate, but. Um, uh, the, the people attending the gallery idea will tell you how it works. And it must be kind of nice if you've never seen one before to see this transformation from a folded two-dimensional pile to a... Now they're all folded up uh, to travel. Please. Uh, well, I might turn this over to Yasmiel, but clearly, um, clearly, yes. Uh, the fact that the, this set of objects is preserved, and forgive me, I don't know whether it's unique or. Uh, that... There's an edition of ten. Right. Ten. But it's a good question because I think for him was um, he's one of the first artists that spoke at that time about storage mm -hmm. installation in those terms as storage. So I think the folding was important because it was about keeping the work in a certain state and then when you unfold it becomes another one and so on. So that was also something that he took very serious from the beginning. And you could, they fit into a big duffel bag. You could take his 10 years of work and you know take it on a plane with you. It's really quite interesting that way. <laughs> 
the, the, another thing that I was reluctant to talk about uh, this evening, because I don't know enough about it, but apparently throughout his career, all, all his work has been made by? His wife. His, now his second wife, yeah, his ex-wife. His ex-wife. And uh, but it, it seems that uh, she might get some more recognition in the, <laughs> really in the presentation of the work. Yes, it's, um, I suppose it's a fascinating situation. It's just like many artists um, who, who send their work to be fabricated. So they were very, they were very close. And she is the, she is the daughter of tailors. Her parents had a tailor shop in their hometown where they're both from. And so she was very, very, she was very good at this. Yeah. You know, um, having just come from Dia and seeing more recent pieces, which are quite elaborate, and everything is always so beautiful that that, that I would have to at least raise the issue that her her participation in the fabrication significant is a significant creative uh, component of the work, and. Uh, with, with all due respect and affection for Franz Erhard Walter, there is a kind of uh, uh, almost uh, medieval, uh, archaic quality to much of his imagery and approach and the Christian symbolism and stuff that might sort of go along with his <laughs> uh, not recognizing the collaboration. <laughs> well, no, I think that it was a very but they're very close to each other, obviously. Um, and I think that having met her, and I would say I would be comfortable saying in public that I think it was a relationship of a commission fabricator, not a, you know, in the same vein as Jod had Peter Valentine do his plywood pieces and so on. But today we know those names, but that's because Jod had a very different relationship with his fabricators, but we don't know the names of the men who did the metal pieces, right, in Long Island City. We could do the research and find out who they were, but they were not, it was not important to know who they were. So I think that Johanna, in, in Franz Erhard Walter's case, it's, it's that. It's a real, it just happens that it was very close to him, but I, I would actually, I don't know, I don't think it's, he's having a medieval treatment, I mean, treat, Treatment of these, I think it was very much uh, part of their re negotiation as a couple and as a. Right? Well, uh, 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 talking about his work tonight, it was tempting to raise a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I got an email from a friend, Jerry Silver, a couple of days ago asking me about a tricky book. Somewhere uh, when I curated a show up for his book art to this artist who I remember his name and um, what we remember was that there was no soul in the bathroom and the artist was up to be France um, because we uh, refrained from Stuttgart to Hamburg because it was uh, a show in the museum there that we went to and uh, we visited France and we had dinner there. What I remember is that we had bread with some fat to put on the bread. This was just very basic. Um, and um, he was just an amazingly warm person. Um, and uh, married to two women. Actually, he was married to one her sister who did or seemed to be there. They were both artists. Uh, I don't know what they were, but I don't know. Um, but um, just the idea of just the basic aspects of, of living at home right now for bread and water. Um, also made me think of tents. You know, the sense that uh, you put up tent, you go to sleep, you fold it, and you move on. So there's a nomadic side there, this kind of ongoing movement, folding, going to another place. A lot of these images that we showed were actually, I think, in space, in a long kind of landscape, open space. 
settling someplace else, maybe popping up again. Uh, and also the idea of rest. Uh, so there is the everyday, this everyday gestures, uh, which are everyday, but uh, there's also this, uh, yeah, primordial kind of the, the basic uh, aspects of, uh, of the ritual of the everyday and, uh, and existence has always been with us so that we had a uh, highly designed architectural building. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know him, the person speaking is my old friend, the artist uh, Heim Steinbach. Uh, Heim, if I could ask you another question. Uh, it's pretty interesting to think of, about him and somebody like Hermann Nietzsche, who you, know, can, you could say it's also primordial, but it's a different kind of primordial. What do you mean? Well, for, for Nietzsche, the primordial is guts or blood or these uh, uh, organic or parts of the body, the, an actual crucifixion with a rope of people. So, so that's primordial as well. But uh, Walter's primordial is completely different than that. Yeah, but it, you know, what, you know, there is, you know, uh, the basic, you know, making food, on um, or gathering, you know, wheat and, and bread, or uh, um, you know, again, making grass. Um, there's so much talking about this teaching and about how it's made and how it weighs on the body. I mean, even the things we were, we take it for granted that they weigh on the body in certain way. No, no, at all. We didn't know anything. We just said our bodies, in a way, we were free of all these constraints. Uh, which on the one hand are constraints and on the other hand, you know, uh, allow us to, uh, to, to, to become and socialize. So. And um, also, the, I think you explain why it's important that those pieces were photographed outside the, the field, the primordial agricultural setting. And that's why when pieces at the end that you cannot use because there are pieces that are for indoors and then there are pieces oh. that are for outdoors. Oh. And the outdoors prove to be too much <laughs> for us to consider letting people use it outdoors. It's, it would just damage them really badly, but the indoor pieces are the ones that can be used. Can you describe your experience of looking at the other person when you're using us to one of those pieces and I don't see how they could have known each other's work. Do you? He, he did. He did know her work. She oh, really? In Paris for a while. Yeah, he did know, but he made, um, I didn't get to talk a lot about it because, but he did mention that he knew who she was at that time. But remember, the communication channels were not as good as we have them now <laughs> in terms of getting to know what other people are doing. Sure. And, but, she but, she said, but he didn't know. Yeah. But in '67 he comes to New York, so he distanced himself for a few years from, from Europe. But yeah, yeah, he did. But did he know, like, uh, Henry Ortiz and the Pan Gomez? No, that he didn't. Because Lija is much older. Mm -hmm. well, we know Lija because she was in Paris, but he didn't know. But in '77 he was the German pavilion for the San Paolo Biennial. Yeah, but that he was already an yeah. old we, we won't stay much longer, but there was a question over here. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, you mentioned the modernist uh, square versus the mystical square, and how those two things kind of integrated in his work. Could you talk a bit about how that trope shows up again and again in other performance artists as well as him? Like, it was the Bruce Nauman shot of him in the square again, and then 
Well, with, with Naaman, I think it's kind of a joke. It's a square, and the piece is called Square Dance, which is a popular reference. But uh, you know, from Malevich onward, the square becomes either uh, something that connotes purity or that connotes some kind of mathematical mysticism. And various artists go back and forth on that throughout the 20th century. And that changes with Foucault and the Well, that, that's a long story. But I wrote an essay about that, which is online, called The Crisis in Geometry. So, uh, the, the Crisis in Geometry. It's, uh, it's on my website. <laughs> no, I think that's great. People don't have to go look for an obscure text. You can just post it. Listen, thank you all very much. I very much appreciate it.